JRPGs, whether traditional or action or tactical or otherwise, actually it lends into my point already, can be kind of hard to get into for many gamers as compared to any other genre for a few reasons. But after speaking with a friend who very much fits this description of not really wanting to get into JRPGs but kind of being curious about them, I asked him what wards you away from JRPGs. And his primary reason was that it seemed really overwhelming and complicated to know where to begin and know where to start if you even want to try and get into the genre. And so I realised quite how many people share this sentiment, and so I want to make a guide that caters to newcomers to the JRPG genre here in 2024, and also give ideas to JRPG enthusiasts on which games they might want to recommend to friends if they wanted to dive in themselves. So the caveats here are that all of these games in this list are games I personally absolutely adore. This is not a list of baby's first JRPG as it were. This is talking about games that I believe to be the most likely candidates to take somebody from not being sure about the genre to knowing enough about it to know whether they love it. All of the games that I have listed here are easily available on modern platforms as well as I feel that retro JRPGs deserve a list all on their own and this is also a list based on what I personally deem to be traditional JRPGs so to speak so turn-based or turn-based adjacent before people come for me and say ATB isn't turn-based it's close enough party-based adventures now I can happily make other lists about tactical or action JRPGs as well, so let me know in the comments below if that's something you'd like to see. But without further ado, let's go into 5 JRPGs that I would recommend to newcomers. So we're going to start with one of the single most recognisable faces on the planet when it comes to gaming as a whole, which is Mario. And Mario is a really approachable character in the gaming world, there's no way of denying that. But there are a lot of JRPG coded games that star Mario that are really, really good and also really accessible for anyone who's never really dived into JRPGs before. Whether you're looking at Super Mario RPG that has just come out as a re-release for the Nintendo Switch, or you have the Mario and Luigi games, we've just had another one of those announced in Mario and Luigi Brothership coming soon. But I'm actually going to take this moment to focus on Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door. The primary reasons I'm picking this particular game out of all of the Mario RPGs that exist are that it's recent, it's widely celebrated from its original release and its new release, and it also has a series all its own. So if people wanted to deep dive a particular brand of Mario RPG, Paper Mario has a bunch of different versions of itself, all with varying degrees of success that people can explore if they want to. A Thousand Year Door is also a very, very strong singular experience. Something that I feel makes JRPGs more accessible to newcomers is the idea that there is more player agency to the actual gameplay loop than just picking an attack or a skill from a menu. You tell people that have never played JRPG before that the gameplay loop is menu based, a lot of people will get turned off by that. But with Paper Mario, you'll find that there's a bit more to it than that. You have timing based attacks, you have little interactions with each of the attacks and skills that you do that make it feel more participatory. The character themselves also benefit from coming from the Mario world. You have a lot of broadly recognisable characters like a Koopa Trooper, a Yoshi, etc. But each of them is very distinctly unique as well. And, you know, there are characters that aren't often shown in Mario games prior that are exclusive to the Thousand Year Door that a lot of people have come to love and LGBT plus people I know there's one character in particular that we've all gravitated towards. Thousand Year Door also isn't hugely long either which I think is a great benefit to somebody who is new to JRPGs. When people think of a JRPG they think oh god this is going to be 100 to 150 hours don't know if I've got time to get into this or not, but Paper Mario actually does a pretty good job of condensing its content into a smaller package. Now, 30 to 35 hours, I say, is about right for Paper Mario Thousand Year Door, and that's not a short amount of time. It's also not overwhelming either, and because save points are very, very sort of intermittently spurred through the game, you can find ways to stop playing very easily. And I think another thing that wards people away from JRPG. The idea that if you're going to sit down to play one you kind of have to continue playing it for the entire night 
And one of the things that many of the games that I have on this list have in common is that that's not always the case. It's nice to be able to play for an hour and then walk away. Or if you want to binge it, you can do that too. And Paper Mario Thousand Year Door absolutely works for that. So now we move on to the second game in the list, which is going to be Sea of Stars. Now, this little indie darling of 2023 is a darling for a reason. Sea of Stars appeals to everything that we JRPG enthusiasts, or at least of a certain age like me, loved when we were kids. It harkens back to Chrono Trigger, Final Fantasy VI, Secret of Mana, Super Mario RPG, funnily enough, and it does so with a modern coat of paint, making it really easy to recommend to newcomers. Like the Mario RPG, Sea of Stars has combat that has more to it than just selecting actions from a menu, but it doesn't detract from the traditional JRPG feel that enthusiasts love. There is player agency in your skills, and they're satisfying. Anyone who's used the Runarang attack playing tennis with your Runarang is really fun, and you know, you get to do that quite a lot throughout the game, but it doesn't ever get old. So having that puzzle-based element to the way the attacks work in terms of attacking weaknesses in combination with that player agency of actually participating in the attacks you're performing makes it a really good entryway into the JRPG genre. Something I've actually spoken to people about before that puts them off is the lengthy cutscenes, and that's very, very true. Like, JRPG enthusiasts tend to kind of lean into that and be happy that there's lots of cutscenes, but a lot of people are intimidated by that. And many of the RPGs that I'm showcasing here don't actually have that all that much. And Sea of Stars and the Super Mario RPG have this. They don't have cutscenes that last too long. Like, they never outstay their welcome. But they still contain really lovable characters. In this case, Garl. Just, you can't not fall in love with Garl. And because those cutscenes don't ever really last longer than maybe a few minutes, you don't have to worry about that by giving it to somebody who is perhaps intimidated by that factor. The audio visuals of Sea of Stars are fantastic as well. I love the soundtrack to this game. I love the way it looks. It's not HD 2D, but we'll, trust me, we'll come to that later. But it still looks beautiful. Very easy to show somebody and say, this isn't old, it's kind of retro inspired, but it still feels modern. And it's still got a really good plot, like it's digestible and it does contain some pretty hefty twists. Us JRPG enthusiasts probably see some of the twists coming, but a newcomer certainly wouldn't. And for me, I actually really enjoy the plot of Sea of Stars, so it's got a magic to it, and I think it'll be nice to show it to somebody new. My favourite thing about Sea of Stars, though, is its level design. Because the level design is broken up into zones with various secrets and hidden items, and loads and loads of interactions with new enemies, new characters, etc. But it's never overwhelming because of the way that they're broken up and you have an overworld, go from one zone to the next, there's a town and there aren't too many of those either so you don't miss things very easily. And it's very, very hard to actually miss stuff in Sea of Stars because that's something I know I worry about when getting into a JRPG is, oh, how much attention do I have to pay to every single thing that happens in case I miss something and I can never go back to it later. That's something that doesn't really happen in this game, and for that reason it's definitely a game I'd recommend. So if you want something a bit larger to dive into, so we're talking anywhere between 60 to 110 hours, so pretty large here, I don't think there's anything better than the third game on my list here, which is Dragon Quest XI S. And it's a bit weird to claim this game just on the name alone, purely because some of the people I speak to on the fence about JRPG have issues with the way in which they're titled, believe it or not. Is it a sequel? Is it a director's cut? Is it an expansion? Final Fantasy suffers from this a lot as well, and it's something that comes easily to us as enthusiasts, as somebody who knows what to expect, but it's a bit of a barrier to people who don't already know the landscape. However, Dragon Quest XI S is a really great way to introduce people into that convention of naming of sequels that aren't really sequels or connected to other games but you'll get references to other games in it because it's such a well-rounded beautifully told story that stands on its own the one word i can use to describe any dragon quest game is charming and i use that word as the highest compliment in the same way a disney movie 
can have you in floods of tears or laughing out loud there's a magic there that is hard to replicate and dragon quest 11 certainly has this in absolute droves the characters are larger than life i mean i have particular favorites namely rab and sylvando and some surprisingly deep storytelling that comes from those characters i shed tears at dragon quest 11 s more than once despite its colorful exterior and there's also tons to look forward to as well with remakes of dragon quest 1 2 and 3 on the horizon actually if you really want a rabbit hole to dive down despite the fact that they're all quite separate despite their in their links individually dragon quest actually has a massively extensive history if one chooses to go down that route including some extremely expensive DS games, one of which I'm still on the hunt for, but each game can be explored and appreciated individually, which I believe opens the door for people to get into a franchise without thinking, oh god, I have to play 20 other games before I play this. Combat is deep, but not too complicated. As a matter of fact, I would say that Dragon Quest XI S has some of the simplest combat, and I use that as a compliment, in modern JRPGs and it's used to such great effect because you have so many different challenges that you can choose to go after but if you want to just experience things as they come everything is very clearly marked you where you need to go there's never a point where you just go oh god what am I supposed to be doing it's always very clear and succinct and that's why I would recommend Dragon Quest now I've said I'm only going to talk about five games in this list, but I'm actually going to make an honourable mention here because I want to give one to the Pokemon. As while I would love to put literally any Pokemon game on this list as something that you'd recommend to newcomers for traditional JRPGs, I found that people get really weird about calling Pokemon a traditional JRPG, despite it very clearly being one. I guess it's just garnered a niche that's all on its own, but I definitely recommend them to people portable they're easy to digest they're full of adorable characters yeah definitely a recommendation but if you're somebody that doesn't see pokemon as a jrpg do leave a comment and tell me why because i genuinely love to know but hey moving on swiftly to the next game so the fourth game on my list is octopath travel this is a brilliant game to get me new into jrpgs into very easily digestible it was originally released for the nintendo switch and it was designed as a chapter based storytelling with more grounded stories around each of the eight characters like you can choose your way to do it you can do each character individually as chapter one then go around again chapter two or you can do a few and then focus on certain characters or you can focus one down if you really wanted to there's so many different ways to play octopath traveler they all work as well so i would absolutely recommend it to a newcomer I also found, in my playthroughs at least, that grinding was very rarely needed, provided that the player doesn't run from fights regularly, and I know heavy grinding is something that puts a lot of people off from a JRPG, and I never really found that I needed that. In the majority of the games that I'm talking about today, actually, there are certain JRPGs where grinding is part of the gameplay loop, and I'm somebody that actually quite enjoys grinding, but none of these games really have it that much like you can do it and make yourself overpowered and maybe that's part of the fun for you as well but you don't have to do it if you don't want to combat is extremely detailed and it's more obvious in the fact that it's puzzle solving oriented due to the way that you break enemy shields by attacking their various weak points and discover those weak points so i think that this is a great jrpg to teach people how to play jrpg because you have to kind of do it that way in octopath traveler but you're kind of expected to do that kind of thing in other JRPGs as well. It's just made more blatant in this particular game. HD2D has spawned many games that adopt its style for a reason, because it's stunning. And the soundtrack to Octopath is one of the best I've ever heard in a JRPG, which is could well be something that's enough to enrapture newcomers all by itself. And I can speak to this game from a personal standpoint as I recently released a video that described Octopath Traveler as a bit of a reawakening for the JRPG genre for me because I kind of burnt out of them for a while and I played this and I just got really into it and I loved it and I sat there and I played it through. I played it for 35-40 hours and I loved it every second of it, got the platinum trophy, went on with it. 
So I can speak from a personal standpoint as to why I would encourage people to play this as a newcomer. But if you want more details on that, then perhaps consider giving that video a watch as well. And then the last RPG I want to talk about today is going to be Final Fantasy X, because Final Fantasy is synonymous with the JRPG genre. Despite the fact that very few entries into this massively story franchise actually represent the traditional version of the classification of a JRPG. Now I'd like to make a video similar to this one about which Final Fantasies I think people that are looking to get into the franchise should play because I actually think that my answer is different depending on who I'm talking to. And in terms of traditional old school JRPG, I think the best game for people to explore this is in part because I think 10 captures the battle mechanics of traditional JRP better than any other Final Fantasy game. The conditional turn-based system, which we've seen a lot of different variations on this since Final Fantasy X, is probably the strongest way to showcase turn-based menu to me. And I think that it allows the player a lot of agency and expression in how they use their characters you end up using all of your party members by swapping in out from like regular battle and just leveling each characters individually and then you have the sphere grid system which isn't too difficult to grasp but it does give you a lot of freedom as to how you want to play it and it even gives you a standard or an expert sphere grid depending on how you want to play it this is of course coupled with one of the greatest stories of its time if not ever in a JRPG still held in high regard as probably the best story Final Fantasy has had. It very much has lovable characters you will always find somebody who loves a character in Final Fantasy X. The overarching world building is extremely potent. Spira is a very believable world that feels lived in. It has its own cultures. It's very rich and I think that X just gives the player a place to immerse themselves into so if there is any final fantasy that i would recommend a newcomer try out and it is readily available on modern platforms even though it is older than a lot of the games i've spoken about on this list already it's got to be final fantasy so yeah that is going to be my five games or jrpgs of the traditional variety that i would recommend to newcomers is there a game that i haven't mentioned on this list that you would recommend to a newcomer Sound off in the comments below and let me know what you think. And of course, if you're not sure what to comment, just type the word algorithm. But that's going to be all from me today. If you've enjoyed what you've watched here today, then consider leaving a subscribe to the channel for more RPG videos. And I've also got a link in the description box below for my Etsy store as well, in which I create art prints of popular video game characters and traits. So I have a Bayonetta and a Melina here from Elden Ring that I've been working on, and I have lots of Final Fantasy and RPG based character as well so that's going to be all from me don't forget to subscribe find me on twitch if you want to see me playing a lot of these games live i'm diving heavily into elden ring and shin megami tensei 5 vengeance at the moment so it'd be lovely to chat to you guys there or if you want to leave a message on my discord or find me on twitter etc you can always talk to me more about rpg so with that i'll love you and leave you thank you very much for joining me i'll see you next time yeah